in the book of Acts. I'm sorry, I'm in Acts chapter 5. We're looking at Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. This is also printed on page 3 of your bulletin. Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. Listen now to God's word. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dare join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick, the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> you know, I've always had a fear of heights. Uh, some would say I am acrophobic. Um, more accurately, actually, I have a fear of falling. Not so much heights, but the fear of that sensation of falling. Sometimes I would wake up at night uh, because I... Have you ever had that? Yes. You're sleeping and then you have this sudden feeling of falling into... You, no, no, who knows what? No, I have that fear of falling. Ever since I was small, I have always disliked the idea of looking down from a tall structure with no safety rails, like at the top of a building, or looking out the floor, uh, looking out of a floor to ceiling glass window in a tall building. This is fine for me because we're on the second floor and because there are frames. But you know the, the, the floor to ceiling windows? And if you're, if you're high up maybe on the 18th, uh, 19th floor and you're looking down and the pavement is beckoning, that, that, that scares me. And so I think I could never do parkour. I could never be Spider-Man in scale buildings. But that said, I quite like and enjoy roller coaster rides and theme park rides that simulate the free fall sensation in the loops or the swings or the drops that these rides give. And I, I know that's, that's, that's a bit inconsistent, but I think, <coughs> I think it, the difference is because with the park rides, I feel like because I am harnessed, I am secured in my seat, the threat of actually falling to my death is much less than if I were, say, walking along the edge of, of a cliff with a 100-foot vertical drop. But my inconsistencies continue. I don't think that I would ever attempt bungee jumping, you see. <coughs> Have any of you gone bungee jumping before? I admire you if you if you do bungee jumping. I don't think that I can ever do it. While it seems like the bungee cord that secures the jumper is really quite safe, considering the percentage of people who actually survive from such a jump, I just think that the idea of jumping off a very tall bridge or cliff or tower is never a good idea, for me at least. And so I hold bungee jumpers in high esteem. I think bungee jumpers are braver than I would ever be to do something like that. But I also think that they are 
more foolish than I will ever be that deaf like that. <coughs> and although technically they're actually quite safe, I guess it's just the whole idea of it. I think it's something I wish I could do, but I don't really wish to do. And so I could do, you know, so I, I will probably never join the ranks of those who check that off of their bucket list. But I will always hold people with such appetites for extreme adventure in high esteem. Now today as we look back in the book of Acts, we come to a third summary observation that Luke makes of the early church community. He's made two summary statements so far. The first one we find in chapter 2, verses 42 to 27. And the second one in chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. And we're going to see more of that later on as, as you um, work through the book of Acts. Um, Luke has that penchant for um, anchoring, if you will, uh, certain episodes. And he would say, and the Lord adds to their number, and, and this is what happens. Okay, and this is one of those passages, very short passage, because it's a summary statement. And we find it here right after we read of God's uncompromising holiness in the judgment of Ananias and Sapphira. In case you missed it, God had struck Ananias and Sapphira dead for daring even to lie to the Holy Spirit. They were lying to God. And so here, this summary statement, this summary text comes right after that episode. And one of the things that Luke records here is the way that the number that a number of the unbelievers were responding to the amazing things that had been happening in the context of the early church community. And so aside from the aside from that episode where Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead and and there was great fear among all who heard, there's also these great report that signs and wonders were being performed, hordes were gathering around the apostles to hear what they had to say. And so one of the things he records, like I said, is the number of unbelievers were responding in a peculiar way. And we see this in verse 13. If you look at verse 13, none of the rest dared join them. But the people held them in high esteem. Now the other response to these same observable occurrences in the church community was that they grew. And so as a summary text, basically Luke here tells us that the church is a place for healing. As a church for healing, and it is admired on the one hand by outsiders, and it is filling up with faithful insiders on the other hand. Insiders who praise God to everyone who would likewise believe. Now if you look at your bulletin, I've entitled today's sermon, God is at work here. And this, it seems, is the overall idea that Luke makes in these verses. He's talking about this community, the early church community, and basically what he's saying is, look at them. God is at work here. And as usual, we will be considering this passage under, under three headings. This is printed on page three of your bulletin. Number one, a place for healing. Number two, mere admiration from outsiders. So that's the first response. And number three, believing praise from insiders. For the little children, uh, we have three keywords for you uh, that you can ask your parents about when you go home, which correspond to the three headings. Power, fear, and praise. These are all on page three of your bulletin. So if you will, keep your bulletins open to page three, your Bibles open to Acts chapter five, as we go through uh, this passage together. If you don't have your Bibles, the text is also on page three of your bulletin. So let's consider the first point. A place for healing. Or for the little children, let's consider here what it says about power. Look at verse 12, and then the, let's look at verse 12 and then verses 15 to 16. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, 
and they were all together in Solomon's portico. And then verse 15 and 16, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So Luke here reports that many signs and the wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. I want you to take note of that. Note that these were performed not by the apostles per se, but by the hands of the apostles. <coughs> this tells us that it is not their own work, but it is God working through them by their hands. What we are seeing here is the Holy Spirit graciously authenticating the early church and her gospel proclamation through the spectacular signs and wonders that were regularly being accomplished by the apostles and reported among the peoples. And it's very important for us, whenever you come across passages that speak of signs and wonders, but in particular when you see passages in the New Testament talk about signs, you're, you are to think, okay, this sign is not there for itself. This sign points to something greater, just as any sign should. So if you're driving down the highway and it says exit 500 meters to a particular exit, exit point, that sign is only as good as you understanding what the sign is telling you. You don't get caught up with that sign or you miss your exit. And so that's what we're seeing here with the signs and wonders. They're there to authenticate a greater reality. This is the reason why in verse 15, Luke tells us that even people from the hinterlands of Jerusalem were bringing their sick and demon-possessed to the apostles for healing. The main message was that the church was a place for spiritual healing, both physical and spiritual. But more, a place for spiritual than physical healing. We see this clearly in the curious report we read about Peter's shadow power. Have you ever read and said, wow, I wish I had a shadow like that? <laughs> but it won't work in, out in daylight. I, I wish I had a shadow like that. So here we read about Peter's shadow power. Now, of course, it was not the case that there was any power inherent in Peter's shadow, but the believers were carrying out the sick into the streets and laying them on cots and mats, believing by faith that as Peter walked by, they would be healed. There wasn't any magic here. The point of it all was that the people truly understood and believed that there was salvation to be found in the believing community and in its agents. There was nothing special about Peter or his shadow for that matter. The believers, they were bringing out those who were sick, laying them on cots. Because they believe that as Peter walked by, whether his shadow touches them or not, he will be saved. And so the emphasis is on their faith and not on the shadow. Note that Luke says in verse 16, in this last verse, right? He says in verse 16 that they all were healed. But in verse 15, Peter's shadow would only likely fall on some of them. They weren't scampering so that Peter's shadow would fall on every one of the people that were laid out. They just laid them out because they knew Peter was going to come. They believed that the power of the Holy Spirit was working through Peter. There would be physical healing as he preached spiritual healing. And truly as they believed in verse 16, we're told they all were healed. There was nothing special or supernatural about Peter's shadow or his gait. 
but there was something very special and supernatural about the message that he bore witness to. As with before, and although it is not explicitly mentioned here, it's a summary text, Peter and the rest of the apostles and the believers with them were witnessing to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. They were witnessing to the power of Jesus' resurrection. And the signs and wonders were merely confirmations of the truth. <clears throat> the signs and wonders were merely confirmations of the truth of their message. As if to say powerfully to the people, what you see and hear now, these signs and wonders... These wonderful healings and renewals that you observe, all these confirm that our message is true. Christ is the risen Lord and King whose kingdom comes and whose will is done and will ever be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever wondered about, <clears throat> as you read the Old Testament, have you ever wondered about the purity laws? Clean, unclean, can you imagine pork is unclean? <coughs> there were purity laws in the Old Testament <clears throat> and they were applied strictly to illustrate a very important point. And that point is the correct corrupting effect of sin and impurity. Everyone who touches something that is unclean automatically becomes unclean for a period of time. And everyone who touches that which is unclean becomes himself unclean. This is the reason why those with skin diseases and, and leprosy, which was considered contagiously unclean in the ritual sense and, and also sometimes in the physical sense, this is why people with, with skin diseases had to announce their presence to everyone as they came. Unclean, unclean! But then, something curious happens when you read the Gospels and you see Jesus. You see, you're reading the Old Testament and the purity laws, the clean, unclean, they are there. If, 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 if the Jews were faithful in observing any of the Mosaic law, they were very faithful in observing the clean and unclean laws. Because they, would, they, they, they had very strict ideas of what is clean and what is unclean. They would never touch pork. Gentiles were dogs. Okay? And then Jesus comes along in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and the contagion stops with him. Have you ever noticed that? In fact, the reverse happens. The unclean is made clean. The broken is made whole. The sick is made healthy, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and the dead are brought to life. And all this signals to the people that something has changed in the order of things. The kingdom of God is breaking in on the sin-slaying world and bringing about renewal and wholeness and healing. And that started with Jesus as you read the Gospels. In, in, in a very powerful sense, he was reversing the power of sin and death. Whenever he would touch a man with leprosy and the person is made clean, witnesses would see, how could that happen? How could he not have been made unclean? And how could the unclean have become suddenly made whole? And it's the same message that we still embody today. It's the message that you see here in this summary statement. The reason why the people were bringing out the sick out from the cross is because they understood something new has dawned. These are followers of that Jesus risen from the grave. That Jesus who, while he was alive, turned things around. Reverse the effects of death and sin. And the thing is, 
For you and I today, it is the same message that we proclaim. The church is a place for healing. In fact, it is the only place for meaningful healing. For here is where the Holy Spirit is at work. In the lives of sinners redeemed by grace. In your life and in my life. Here is healing that goes beyond that which is physical without ignoring it. We may no longer be witnessing the kind of signs and wonders that were performed by the Holy Spirit through the hand of the apostles in the early days of the church. We don't have apostles anymore. The days and the need for those authenticating signs have long passed. But we still are witnesses to the same great Lord and healer who offers salvation to all who would repent and believe. But while we may no longer be agents of God's physical healing to the people we minister to, we still proclaim that the healing Christ brings is holistic. We do not ignore the physical aspect. We preach salvation, which is not just for your souls, but extends also to your bodies. We still proclaim that the healing Christ brings is holistic extending both to the soul and to the body. We witness to the risen Christ, and because He rose from the grave, our hope is not just for a spiritual salvation or release from the material world. Our hope is for a complete and glorious renewal and restoration of all things, both visible and invisible, when our Lord returns. So does this mean that we should no longer pray for physical healing <clears throat> for those who are sick and infirm? Of course not. We pray for healing because we trust that the Sovereign Lord is wise and will do what is good. Sometimes He grants healing. Sometimes He delays it. Sometimes in His wisdom, we have to wait for glory, for the wholeness that we pray for. But the point is that it will come. The trajectory of world history is ultimately to that day when Christ returns to restore all things to Himself. The glimpses that we see in the Gospels, Jesus reversing the effects of sin and death, one day He's going to come in glory and splendor and He will make all things right. That's a trajectory of world history. But in the meantime, the church remains a place for healing. And we, brothers and sisters, remain witnesses and heralds of salvation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you look at this summary statement that Luke provides, many signs and wonders were being performed in the hand of the apostles. And they were bringing people down out of the streets in cots to be healed. And they were bringing people also from the hinterlands coming to be healed. We must not be caught up with the signs and the wonders. We must look beyond the signs and actually see what is being spoken of. The church is a place for healing, not because of you, not because of me. The church is a place for healing because here God is at work. Here God is saving souls. And here, saved souls have hope for glory. So that's the first thing we see. A place for healing. Secondly, mere admiration from outsiders. Now, little children, here you see that those who were on the outside, they were looking in and they were not, they were scared. They wouldn't dare join them. But they say, that's good. That what you're doing is good. And that's what we see. Look at verse 13. None of the rest dared to join them. But the people held them in high esteem. Now, if you look at verse 14, the verse after, it says, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. 
You read verse 13 and verse 14 together, and then you have to take pause and say, hold on, isn't Luke contradicting himself here? In verse 13, he says, none of the rest dared to join them. No growth. The people held them in high esteem, but they were still outsiders. And in verse 14, he says, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So, is Luke contradicting himself here? Superficially, it may look like that. First, he says that the rest of the believe people dare not join the believers. But then the next verse, he says that more than, more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. You will remember that the last count was 5,000 men. Include, not including women and children. But here, Luke seems to have already lost count in verse 14. But why does he say that no one would dare join them, but also that more than ever believers were being added to the Lord, both men and women? What Luke is saying here is something that we have come to expect with people and the proclamation of the gospel. There will always be two kinds of responses when we preach the gospel. There will always be two kinds of responses when people are confronted with the Jesus of the Bible. One is of acceptance and belief, and the other is of rejection and unbelief. But perhaps what is not as expected, or I should say what is at least what may not be as expected in our own experience is the attitude that the unbelievers or outsiders maintain in relation to the believing community. Look at verse 13 again. None of the rest dare join them. That is to be expected. But the people held them in high esteem. The people held the believing community in high esteem. In Greek, the idea here is that the, outside, the outsiders, though not daring to join the Christians, were nevertheless sympathetically singing their praise. They, weren't, they wouldn't dare join. They just heard about Ananias and Sapphira. They wouldn't join because they heard about Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. And so they were sympathetic, but they wouldn't join. They wouldn't join because perhaps it was, they counted the cost and they said, it's too costly. Very likely they would have already caught wind of what happened at Nice and Sapphira, no doubt. They've already learned of the sacrificial generosity and mutual love that existed among the believers. Perhaps they have already heard and understood the gospel proclamation by the apostles. And more than that, perhaps they have already considered the implications of the gospel and of repentance and faith. But they just couldn't. It's too risky, they may have thought to themselves. It's too costly. And so instead of joining, they maintain their distance, while at the same time, They maintain their distance while at the same time holding the believers in admiration. But this is foolish and ill-advised. Unfortunately, there are still many, even today, who are like this. Perhaps our family, our friends, who admire the fact that we're churchgoers who think that being religious is a good thing. Everyone needs religion. Everyone needs your faith. Just not too much of it. But they just think it isn't for them. Many today, people even who for a season of their lives perhaps have gone to church and have become active, but who have since become busy and had, as they would say, gotten on with their lives. Oh, church? Yeah, yeah, I, I tried that for a time several years ago. It was fun. I learned a lot, but I guess I've outgrown it now. These people are not openly opposed to the church and to Christianity, but their mere admiration 
will do them no good in the final analysis. Their polite declining of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is just that. It is a rejection of the only Lord who could save them from eternal damnation. This is the first response to the believing community and the Christian message that Luke tells us here in this text. This is, there is a second and proper response which we will see in our next point. But at this point, I cannot help but remind, be reminded of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, where he writes, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. You see, that's, that, that has come to be expected. <clears throat> and if you are discouraged from sharing the gospel, if you're seeking faithfully to communicate the gospel to your friends, to your loved ones, if you're seeking faithfully to live out the implications of the gospel, in your vocation, and you're being persecuted for it, that has come to be expected. There will always be those who would vehemently oppose you and reject you. There will be those who receive your message as a sweet balm for their souls, repent and believe, and, and are embraced as brothers and sisters. And then there's the middle people. People who Say, live and let live. Oh, you're a Christian? That's good, that's good, that's good. I have an uncle who's a Christian also. But they would not take part. You know, there's a lesson here for us. In our zeal to preach the gospel, we must be mindful of the manner by which we communicate the truth of Christ to others. We desire not to be well esteemed because of how nice we are how eloquent we are in fact we do not desire that people heap praise on us because our ultimate mission is that people end up praising jesus unfortunately what we see here with the outsiders was they were praising the christian community oh that's a great community look at them they're so so uh, generous to one another look at them care for each other look at them oh somebody sold property and then there's they're they're giving to those who are in need oh that's a nice that is that that's that's a nice way to do life together and to do church together and then you ask them would you like to oh, no, not not for me not for me but the good thing there is the church is held in, in high esteem we do not desire that people keep praise on us because our ultimate mission is that people end up praising Jesus. But this does not mean that we have a license to be insensitive and arrogant jerks just because we are convinced that we are correct. We must work hard at being both bold and faithful in our proclamation of the gospel but also winsome and sincere in our appeal to sinners. Many of you, like myself, saw yesterday a debate between one of our fellow Filipino <laughs> and another one of our fellow gospel believers. Okay? A debate between Dr. James White and Brother Joe Ventilesio. Really what stood up for me in that debate I'm not going to talk about what happened. What stood up for me in that debate, and what humbled as well as impressed me, was the way that Dr. White <coughs> communicated the gospel. And we need more of that in the church. You know, I have no doubt that many unbelievers who watched the debate yesterday 
and there were about 8,000 watching live on my account, uh, on the IMC live stream, and on the uh, South Dakota Apologetics live stream. About 8,000 uh, at one time. I'm sure there were more. I have no doubt that many of those would have noted how sincere and winsome Dr. White was in his witnessing to Christ the God-man, who is the hope of the world. And so if there's anything we learn from how the outsiders in the early church treated the church or esteemed the church, it must be that aside from the message that they preached, they were consistent in the witness that they showed. There's a quote that Tim Chalice um, posted last year uh, around this time and Facebook reminded me of it so I reposted it. It's a quote by a man named John McGowan. He says, and I quote, People may not agree with our theology, but they shouldn't be able to argue with our lives. And I think that sums up very beautifully the the kind of witness that should adorn the, the kind of light that should adorn our witness to the risen Christ. Last point. Believing praise from insiders. Verse 14. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. Now here's the other thing that Luke reports here in this text. More than ever. I think that's the first time I ever read that in the Bible. More than ever, believers were added to the Lord. And I love that expression, added to the Lord. They were not just added to the church per se. It was to the Lord that they were added. Jesus was collecting on his inheritance. Countless believers, Luke seems to have lost count. And not just men this time, multitudes, he says, of both men and women. It's amazing. Truly, the gospel will always have a polarizing effect on all who hear it. We saw in verse 13, those who would still reject it, albeit in a polite manner, and here in verse 14, those who would receive it with earnestness and, 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 and hearty faith. Some would reject, some would be polite, but others, indeed many, would respond in repentance and faith and there find joy and peace and salvation as they are added to the Lord. Those who were on the outside praised the church. They praised the Christians for what they observed, but they were merely praising the effect and not the source. These ones, these multitudes of both men and women, who tells us, they joined the rest of the believers in Solomon's portico and they gave praise in their witnessing, not to themselves, but to God. Now you're probably sitting there and saying, but it's just a few verses, doesn't say anything about preaching the gospel, doesn't say anything about witnessing, what are you talking about? Look at verse 15. So that, even, that, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cotton mats, that as Peter came by, at least the shadow might fall on some of them. Now, in, the, in our first point, we established that this was not it. They were not being superstitious. They were not bringing out the people. They were not fighting for real estate space wherein they can be sure that Peter's shadow will fall on the people they brought out. Verse 16 tells us, all were healed. So what was this exercise? What was it all about? These believers, they were bringing out their friends, their loved ones who were infirm because they were telling them there's something wonderful happening. You know that Jesus who was crucified he has risen from the grave 
and wonderful signs and powerful healing is happening. Come. Come and see. And that's what they're doing. They carry the sick out to the apostles. Why? In order to be healed physically? Well, yes. But more than that, they carried them out so that they could hear the gospel preached. So that they could find healing, not just for their physical bodies that will still one day die and be buried. All of those who were healed died. That was in point. But for a more comprehensive salvation and healing for both body and soul. For resurrection and for glory. The wonderful thing I find about this summary is how little details Luke gives us about the faith of these people. In fact, we're not told that the people believed or repented or had faith, just that multitudes of believers were added to the Lord. But that is enough information if you know the context of what is going on. In verse 16, he says that they, all who came for healing, were healed. And we could only piece these information together to say that everyone who came and were healed were, like the man lame from birth, healed by faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Luke refers to them as believers who were added to the Lord. Now in closing, here we find in these few verses a superb summary of the kind of power that was evident in the early church. Signs and wonders performed through the hand of the apostles, confirming and authenticating the message that they preached. And this evoked two very different responses. A polite admiration and praise for the people of God, but a rejection of their God in Christ. And a hearty belief and exercise of faith in the only one whose name there is salvation and healing and wholeness. Well, what does it mean for us? Well, for believers, we can learn something from our early forebears. <coughs> People may not agree with our theology, but they shouldn't be able to argue with our lives. <coughs> but if you're not a believer, I can understand your hesitation. Perhaps you understand the cost it entails. Persecution, uncompromising holiness, lifestyle change, giving up certain things that may not be helpful in one's spiritual life. And I don't blame you. Perhaps you're just not sure it's worth it. You know, last week, my one-year-old phone um, had some tantrums. And it's still having tantrums. Basically given up on me. So I'm back to an old trusty phone that is broken. But I'm in, a, I'm in a market for a new phone. And you know, if you're, if you're buying a new phone, the prudent thing for you to do is to go on YouTube, look at reviews, you know, search, read about it. What are the pros, what are the cons? Is it really worth it? Before you make a decision to buy a new phone or to buy anything that is um, um, that, that, that has a hefty price tag for that matter, you do due diligence, right? You research, you learn about it, you look at options, alternatives to make you help you make an informed decision. So I can understand if you're an unbeliever here today and you feel, is it really worth it? There's gonna be persecution. Maybe my friends are not gonna like me anymore. Maybe I'm gonna to have to stop certain things. I'm gonna stop peddling drugs. Are, are, you, are you considering, are you thinking, is it worth it? Perhaps what you need to do is just that. If you're on the fence, and I suggest to you, keep coming. Keep searching. Keep asking questions. Keep looking into the scriptures. Because what I can tell you is this. He is worth it. 
from my experience, and I'm sure for many of our brothers and sisters here, it is the same. He is worth it. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following, Paul writes, Have this mind among, you, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. My friend, Jesus asks everything of us. Because he gives all of him to us. And that's why it's worth it. And you're polite. Oh, you know, I like your church. I like people. I like what's going on. We really love one another. It's not going to be enough in the last day. Jesus does demand for you to be added to him. And it's going to cost you. Because he asked everything of you. And why wouldn't he? When he has given you all of you. That's right. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for this ongoing study that we have uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, truly, it is marvelous to see how your spirit has worked through this church community from its earliest days how you have fulfilled uh, what you said, that the Holy Spirit will come upon your apostles, and they, were, and they will have power, and they will be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. And here, Lord, in this summary statement, we see once more how you powerfully authenticated the message of the gospel with signs and wonders. But you remind us that we need to look beyond the signs to the reality. And the reality is that Jesus has come. And his kingdom is breaking in on this world. And one day he will come and he will make all things new. And he will make all things right. And so the call for us today is to respond in faith. Not to be like those who praise the church who politely say, hold the church in high esteem, but would not join. But as those who, with great faith, <coughs> praise not the effect, but the very God in Christ who makes it, makes all of it possible. So I pray, O oh Lord, that as we continue to study through the book of Acts, as we continue to meditate on these things, Lord, that your word will continue to enrich us, that your spirit will continue to shape us and mold us uh, more and more into the image of your Son. We pray all of these things for your glory in Jesus' name.